morning. I'm so glad to be here. It's Tuesday morning. We're going to continue with 2 Timothy 3, but before we do that, I just want to welcome you. If you're brand new to Amplified, I know that uh, we've had lots of new people added over the last few days and weeks. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening, whatever time you happen to be joining us. Excited that you're here. If you ended up in Amplified and you had no idea how you got here, probably somebody added you because they love you. We're going through one chapter a day in the Word and we're discussing it and it becomes a running discussion all day. So we just go for about 30 minutes here and um, love to hear your comments throughout the, throughout the day. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Zizi. Hi, Nina. Uh, hi, David Doty. Well, should we jump on in? I think we should. Grab your Bibles if you've got it or read along with the notes. I think you can see the notes. Somebody will have to tell me. I think you can see the notes while I'm going through it because I'm posting my notes. And we're using the New Living Translation for us. Hi, Marsha. All right, here we go. This is uh, titled in my Bible, I don't know about yours, but it's titled The Dangers of the Last Days. So it's really interesting for those of, of you who've been tracking along for a while, how many times Paul is teaching on the end times again and again and again. It's surprising because most times in the church, we want to steer clear and say, you know, that's kind of an obscure thing or let's push that back. But through Paul's letters, Again and again, he is referring to the end times. And so it's not something we want to um, shy away from or look away from. And in fact, we can't if we're just going chapter by chapter, right? So morning, Mom. Morning, Debbie Salido. So glad you guys are here. Here we go. Verse uh, chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. It says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. All right. Well, here's quite a list, right? And I wonder many times if every generation since the time Paul wrote this letter um, could relate to this. You know what I'm saying? Um, because I sure can identify with this. I, I wonder if you can. You know, when I think about even the television shows that are on TV, we don't even just have this. We celebrate this list, right? We celebrate a generation that considers nothing sacred. We celebrate cruelty. We celebrate hatefulness. We celebrate shows where children disobey and dishonor their parents. It's really maybe even a step up from what Paul had in mind. But, um, don't you agree that, that we're in this, right? I, I mean, I'm sure that every generation could have said, yeah, I see this. But um, the fact that we, like I said, we highlight it, we celebrate it, is something to consider. It's the last line that really strikes me and that I want to talk about just for a few minutes right here. It's in verse 5. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. My biggest concern as a pastor in the church today, and you've got to remember, I'm within the charismatic movement. So, you know, if I was growing up in another denomination, um, maybe this wouldn't be the case, but I'm not. So I'm, I'm not speaking or uh, preaching or pastoring in a vacuum. I'm dealing with um, the the stream that I'm in. And one of my biggest concerns for for the church today, meaning charismatic stream church today, is all of this talk about grace and the finished work of Christ, but what without a desire for holiness, right? It's it's this idea of apostling, but you know, without a desire to be holy, um, without a desire to have the power of God working in our lives for godly character to be formed. 
Um, so, I, you know, I rarely see people or have to counsel people out of being legalistic. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm saying in this particular stream of people, I can think of two times in the last 10 years where I've had to counsel someone for fear that they were putting their faith in their uh, ability to, you know, walk out the law and walk out um, fasting in prayer. And it was becoming a completely legalistic thing. And in fact, one of those two people was from another country, another culture, which that culture uh, pursues things in, a, in that, that legalistic faster. So I don't think in our stream, in my stream, this is something that, you know, we're going, please stop, stop obeying the loving instructions of God and putting your trust in that. You know, that's not been my experience in pastoring. And maybe you'll have a different one. But w- what I see is people pursuing um, um, freedom or using the word grace to justify all sorts of sin. And so that's obviously what I'm pastoring in and what I'm passionate about speaking into. Wait a, wait a minute. The grace of God is his divine empowerment within us to live holy, to pursue him as he is, right? If he calls us to be free from sin, then we need to be free from sin. So it's interesting to me that Paul is talking about this in this whole list of terrible things. He's saying there's going to be also a group of people that will act religious, but they're going to reject the power of God that could make them godly. Right. And then his counsel to Timothy is stay away from that. It, you know, why didn't Paul tell Timothy, hey, Timothy, you know, that would be a good thing to try and, you know, debate. Why don't you go and try and debate those people and, and really draw them into holiness? He doesn't do that. And maybe you have thoughts of why he didn't do it. I'd love to hear you. I mean, it's interesting. He doesn't tell Timothy to go and persuade. He tells Timothy, run away from that. Get away from that. Interesting, right? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm sure you've, you, you'd say something different than, than I would come up with, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm just pointing out that in his love for Timothy, he's telling Timothy, don't waste your time there. Just get away from it. He's looking at Timothy as a young man, right? And he's trying to keep Timothy straight into the pursuits of God where he's not going to get sidetracked. Interesting that maybe this is a possible sidetrack and maybe you've had experience where you're going to try and counsel your friend who's really caught up in something like this I wonder maybe you have something to weigh in on this yep Robin's saying no debates right I mean has anybody ever um been saved because of winning you know they lost the debate and you won the debate has anybody ever said wow okay I'm gonna think I, I really hear you here let me bow my knee maybe so we always need to have an answer Right. Um, But there's a difference between having an answer when we're being asked and pressed and coming in with the spirit of debate. At least that's my opinion. All right. So grace should lead us into holiness. Did I get that in there? I try and fit that in there every day. Right. (laughs) Can't help it. I can't help it. (laughs) All right. Verse six. They are kind. They are the kind. Paul's talking about this. Um this false movement. I think he's still addressing that last verse from verse five, verse six. He says, they are the kind, these false people, they are the kind who work their way into people's homes and they win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they're never able to understand the truth. Woo! All right, Paul, take it down, right? He's going for it. This immediately makes me think, um, I mean, do we see this playing out today with with these imposter kind of messengers coming in and working into the homes? Maybe we need to consider um, Christian television as something that is still fitting the bill for this, right? I think a lot of what passes on Christian TV has nothing to do with the gospel, Um, Of course, now you're about to hear, you know, I've got my soapbox here, but right, a lot of what passes on Christian television isn't the gospel. It isn't designed to bring the hearer up into unity in the faith. It's designed to cause the hearer to become dependent on, quote, the man or the woman of the hour. That is dangerous, 
right? It's a, if you give me a gift of a hundred dollars, if you give if you give me the gift of a hundred dollars, and that thing that that you're praying for, God's saying to you, "Thus saith the Lord." Here's the word: God will bring that to pass for you. You will have breakthrough for just a hundred dollars because this ministry is so set apart. If you give a hundred dollars, then you know whatever. Or I've I've even watched while. Um, a prophetess of the hour said, if you'll, if you'll give me $150, $150, and I will give you a prophetic word about who your husband is going to be. I mean, what in the world, right? And the strange thing is people do it. They buy it. They, they, they give their $100 in. They give their $100. It's, they're unstable, right? And so instead of helping people come out of instability, they market They pounce on that instability for the sake of building their own little kingdom. That has nothing to do with the gospel. It has nothing to do with the fivefold ministry gifts that have been given. Go back to Ephesians 4. What are the fivefold ministry gifts given for? It's to raise the body up into unity of their faith so that if there was a gap, and maybe there's not, but if there was a gap, We're all walking in perfect love, perfect unity, perfect trust in Jesus. We're not exploiting one one another in weakness. Isn't that amazing? So I I kind of think, wow, are we seeing verse 6 play out in ways, you know, it's not just one person coming into one house. We're able to take one person and they can go into 100,000 houses at one time. I'm just saying, um, if anyone is ever manipulating you for money, um, or to say, I'll, I'll give you this word, but I need you to pay. You need to stay away from that. Do not sow into ministries like that. Be released, right? Be released. The, the, the goal of God is to raise you up so that you're able to learn how to discern his voice, learn how to go through the word, learn how to obey him. Amen. What's, what's Jen saying? Yeah, gifts are not given for selfish gain. We didn't have to buy them. They're freely given. This, when we give, we cannot charge. Thus, when we give, we cannot charge. I think she's saying yes. Oh, yes, all the time. I do not like TV for for my word. Good. The Bible's your word. Um, Yes. So we're kind of living in this, right? It's kind of amazing that um, this word isn't irrelevant because it's 2,000 years old, right? It's maybe more relevant than it was when he even wrote it for, for our generation. Okay, let's keep going. Because this is going to, he's even going to get into it a little more. Verse 8. These teachers opposed the truth, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. They've depraved minds and a counterfeit faith, but they won't get away, they won't get away with this for long. Someday, everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Janus and Jambres. Now, those of you who have been in the word forever, you're saying, who in the world? And I'm probably saying their names wrong. They're not here, so I got to just go with what I know. Uh, Who's Janus and Jambres? Well, if you've read the Old Testament, which is where you'd find Moses, he's saying these are two people that opposed Moses. So did we see that in the book of Exodus or was it in Leviticus or no? Numbers, Deuteronomy? Where's the story? It's actually not in our canon. So you'd have to go back to other letters that we don't have in our Bible to see who are these men. And I did put a link there in the notes, right? The, yes, the Talmud, this, this is in the, the, uh, the, there's some midrash talk about this. But here's what I'll say, just for the sake of time. These are two men who were believed to have been sorcerers in Pharaoh's court. So remember in those Uh, passages where Moses is going in with his staff and he's throwing the staff down and the staff is becoming a snake and then Pharaoh sorcerers they would be able to do it and they would throw a staff down and they they would create snakes and yet Moses's snake ate the other snakes remember these these um contests really contests of power in Pharaoh's court well um as the sayings go as the stories um that were told these are two men who were probably sorcerers in Pharaoh's court, and tradition follows that these two men, when Egypt left, excuse me, when Israel left Egypt, these two men also left Egypt and came with Israel. There, there's um, stories that put them. Um, remember when Aaron is making the golden calf? 
right? Those of you who know uh, the book of Exodus, Aaron's making the golden calf and these two men are there encouraging Aaron and, and drawing the people into this false worship. So it's really interesting story since Paul refers to people that we don't have in our text. Um, there's nothing wrong with going and saying, what's he referring to here and looking through that. So we do have um, a New Testament equivalent, I think. And so I will give you bonus points. Those of you who could name this kind of spirit operating in the brand new church, it's in the book of Acts, um, this false sorceress kind of power where it is joining itself to the Lord and saying, hey, we're doing the same thing. And that is, it's like that little bit of leaven, right? It's a falseness creeping in and joining itself with the pure thing. And if we're not careful, if we don't call it out, it leads the whole people astray. And so um, here in this letter, Paul is equating what we just talked about with this false sorcery movement. Yes. And he's talking about these two men drawing away, these two men representing a counterfeit faith. And he's saying, but in time, it's all going to be seen for what it is. Who can name in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, a uh, sorcerer, right? Somebody who's converting to Christianity and yet they still want to buy um, with money. They want to buy the power of God. Give you bonus points if you can name it. Here we go. Let's keep going. Verse 10. But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know, my faith, my patience, my love and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I've had to endure. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, but the Lord rescued me from all of it. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Woo, we don't get out of it, do we? But evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. <laughs> you guys don't know it? That fella who wanted to buy, what's his name? What's his name? You guys name it. Okay, name it later because we got to keep going right here. <laughs> here we go. Paul instructs, being a messenger for God. Let's talk about this for a minute. Being a messenger for God, it's the whole package. It's not just about knowing the message. It's about living the message, right? And Paul is giving us this list. There it is. There it is. Robin Hill. Ding, 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 ding. Robin, 10 points, girl. 10 points. That's right. All I can think of is Simon the Sorcerer. That's right. And so he gets saved. He gets saved, but he's not repentant of this uh, longing and desire for a power. Any way he can get it, he wants his power. And who does he ask? He asks, oh, he sees the apostles laying hands and people are receiving the Holy Spirit. And he wants to buy that power, doesn't he? He wants to buy it. He says, oh, give that to me. And if you go back and look at the way he was rebuked, I mean, it's pretty, pretty remarkable, right? He's just, um, Peter, Peter basically says, get, get behind me, you know, shame on you for thinking you could buy this power. You pray now and repent and see if the Lord will forgive you. I mean, there's no, Hey, but brother there is, it's, it's, uh, right. He wants the power, the, 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 the power, not just the power to lay hands on one another, the power to be above others, right? That's the, that's the charge here. Okay. Back to Paul's charge to Timothy. And he's talking about Timothy. You know how I've taught you, you know, how I live, you know, what my purpose in life is, you know, my faith, you know, my patience, you know, my love, you know, my endurance, you know, the persecution that I've had to suffer. And you know how I've endured. Paul is charging Timothy to not only look at all of these things in Paul's life, but to uh, imitate these things, right? Paul's saying, I want you to remember the whole package, not just what I taught, Timothy, but how I lived what I taught, how I, how I purposed my life around what I said I believed, right? I, I didn't just preach one thing and then when we went off to dinner after the service, I lived another way. I lived according to another purpose, right? He's calling Timothy to remember the whole package. He's warning Timothy here. He's saying, Timothy, if you've got your eyes on success, I need you to uh, remember that's not the goal here because, and he says it, right? He's saying, 
here it is, but evil people and imposters. Imposters of what? Imposters of what we've just talked about. Imposters of uh, those who are pretending to be messengers from God. Uh, they're going to flourish. They're going to have unbelievable success. And Timothy, if you're shooting for success, if that's the thing you're going for is ministry success, it's a trap and, and, uh, it's the wrong goal. The goal is to be faithful to God. The goal is to be faithful to the command of God on your life. The goal, whether it lands you in prison, right? Which would have been, oh, just, um, not just terrible because it's prison, but it would it really would have been shameful, right? Uh, instead of being revered as a rabbi, Paul's in prison for his faith. Instead of being revered as somebody holy, right, with the long robes and the and the uh, oh look, there's the rabbi. Paul is is being spit upon and disregarded, and Paul is calling Timothy and saying, Timothy, if you shoot for you know respect in the marketplaces and applause in the marketplaces. It's going to lead you astray. You're going to be deceived and you're going to deceive. You need to set your heart on living the message, right? On living the gospel. And this is hard for us too. And I know many of you, you feel called to full-time ministry and, oh man, if I could save you, um, some of the almost, um, confusion and despair I've walked through over years, I would just say, uh, don't put your hope in ministry success. You know, don't, it's such a trap and you start to look at this person and this thing and how come, you know, I'm just in this little place right here and God, I thought you said I was going to be called to the nations and I'm just, right? And and you, you start to put your eyes on these things and, and it's such a trap. One, it breeds such a discontent in our hearts and slowly but surely, we begin to start to live and start to long for a success that has nothing to do with being faithful to God. And if I could save anybody who's listening to me, that hardship, that, that um, trap, I mean, just hear me. Don't, don't put your eyes on that. Keep yourself faithful to the command of God. Put, set your heart on living the message that God's given you to speak. Amen. If you have a word from heaven and it's whatever it is, you know, your job is to, yes, say it clearly, but live it clearly. Live that message. Live that message. That's going to be the thing that you're held accountable for when you stand before God. This is so, so, so important. And I'm not trying to say that everybody who's seeing success in ministry is an imposter and a deceiver. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, there sure are a lot of people who are seeing ministry success and they are imposters and they are deceived and they are deceiving. I'm not saying everybody. I'm saying that cannot be the thing we're looking at to determine whether that thing is the word of the Lord or not. Do you hear me? So be careful. Be careful on this. It's just the way that Paul is warning Timothy. I can say, I want to warn you, don't set your heart to pursue success. Pursue the Lord. Pursue faithfulness to the Lord. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Zizi's saying, every story is an end time story. The same power as Satan did to be like God. Um, Robin's saying, that's how Lucifer felt. He wanted to be like God. Right, I think we're still referring there to the sorcery top topic. Amen. The proof is in the pudding, so to speak. Amen. Jen saying, gosh, God just spoke to me about this. I've desired to be influential, but God really spoke to me and told me that I've lost sight of servitude. I've had to repent for desiring influence selfishly. I've had to humble myself and pray that all things are about Jesus. It's deceiving because it's good to want to be influential, but for personal gain, um, that's not okay. It's all about Jesus, right? And the thing is, is I don't think um, even the even the best of us, right? Even the purest, once we start to desire uh, that and pursue that, it, it does do something um, sets our, it just sets our eyes on something other than Jesus. Right. And so it's, it's just such a trap guys. Right. And especially I think in America where you've got to kind of recognize what we're living in culturally. And I know not everybody who's listening to Amplified lives in America, but those of us who are Americans, you've got to think, what is the God? What is the, what is the, yeah, God over our nation? And um, it's success, right? 
right? It's, it's, it's success. It's being the self-made man. It's, it's um, you know, who's made it? Who's successful? Who's rich? Who's this? Who's... So because we're living in a culture that, I mean, celebrates that, honors that, uh, and not that there shouldn't be an honoring of success. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm trying to get you to see you live within a culture. You don't live within a vacuum. You are living day and night in a culture that celebrates and idolizes success, right? And sometimes we forget that because we live in it. I always notice it when I travel to other countries. Uh, it's remarkable. Oh, that's not here. That's not what this culture is celebrating and worshiping. Americans, I would say, worship success. We got to be careful here. It's a trap. Yes. All right. Verse 14. See, even this do it amplified. I got dogs barking. I got no makeup on. You know, whatever. It's it, one of the things that I've appreciated about doing Amplified is that it's such a great reminder that it's not about looking good, being perfect, having just awesome revelation every single moment of the day. You know what we're doing when we come together every day? We're remembering this is about faithfulness. It's about low and slow, right? It's not about overnight success because just doing one chapter a day, it's going to take forever. <laughs> but that's good. That's good, right? It's just, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, it's just about loving you. It's just about loving you. It's not about impressing one another, right? Isn't that what we're doing? I just love this. It, this has been like such an awesome reminder um, that it's not about that. For me, it, it is, right? Oh, look, there's my Janaya. She joined. Hi, Junie. That's my girl. All right, verse 14, I'm running out of time. Here we go. But you, he's talking to Timothy, Paul is talking to Timothy, but you must remain faithful to the things that you've been taught. You know they're true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they've given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and it's useful to teach what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Right? The scriptures should be convicting to us on a daily basis, right? It, it, it's saying, hey, do this, don't do that. Yield here, surrender here. Right? Isn't this amazing that this doesn't sound like um, something that maybe we'd hear in our charismatic stream of churches? Wait a minute, I don't, I, I'm free from the law. There's nothing I have to yield to. No, no, no. We're never free from the loving instructions of God. We've been set free so that we can live into the loving instructions of God. Right? Colton's saying it's all about our commitment to loving him. Yay, I love Colton. Colton, I pray for you every day nearly to get your work schedule changed. I love you so much, brother. Marcia's saying faithfulness, yes. Deborah's saying low and slow, that's good. Paul's saying yes, keep your eyes on him. is saying it's also about how the Lord measures success. You know, perspective. I think that's why Paul encouraged Timothy the way he did. Timothy, remember, it's all about the age to come. It's all about... Um, eternity. His admonishments are here, are for us too. We succeed by living a life worthy of the calling of Christ. Absolutely. It looks countercultural. Yes, I 100% agree. It's about perspective. Because so obviously God wants us to be successful, yes, but he's measuring it from a different place, right? That, that's the, I'm not advocating, let's all just be slugs. No, no, no. Because we've been talking about doing all things with excellence it's just, it's just a different perspective, right? Excellence from the perspective of our Father, right? Excellence from a different perspective. Amen. David saying reproof. Yes, when we're talking about the scriptures. So stay faithful. Stay in the word. That's what you're doing. Let the scripture do its work in you when you're convicted by something that the Lord is speaking. Yes, do, do what Jen just talked about. Repent. God, I'm so sorry. Help me, Holy Spirit. Help me, lead me in this area in the way that pleases you and blesses you. Let the scriptures equip us. Let the Holy Spirit come and highlight and breathe life into the word that you're looking at. 
And always remember the Holy Spirit, we can trust him. He will never lead us outside of the boundaries of God's loving instructions for us. No, no, no. His job is to help us live into them. Amen. To empower us to be holy, to be set apart unto God, to empower us to be happy, even when we don't understand how this and this and this is going to work out. And yet we are filled with God. And we see from another perspective because we've been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, right? Remember what we learned in Ephesians? Oh, it's the Holy Spirit reminding us and giving us access to the reality of heaven that is unshakable. Amen. I love you guys. Father, we just invite you to to convict where you want to convict. But God, we also ask for your divine empowerment today. Holy Spirit, we say, come, come, breathe on our lives, empower us. Empower us, God. Give us grace. Give us grace to live a life worthy of the calling, just like my friend Zizi says, worthy of the calling that you've given us. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We love this time together. We appreciate you, God. And and we look forward to all that you'll unfold to us today. Holy Spirit, speak to us all day long. We want to hear your voice all day long. In Jesus' name, amen. I sure love you guys, and I will uh, see you tomorrow.